talk birdie to me with mk wizard again and we are going to be talking about breaking lore specifically when it works when it doesn't so go ahead hey there papa gunner good to be back and like you said we are breaking lore when does it work when it does it not and why so Let's talk birdie. But before we do, I just want to let you know that I will not be covering documentaries because they're not lore. They are facts and actual events. We are only covering fiction and we are also not covering spoofs, fan fiction or school plays because they're all good, clean fun. They don't abide by rules. They're just about making you laugh and having fun. Same with cosplays and everything. We are solely going to focus on professional works that were meant to be taken seriously. So, like I said before, we are going to talk about three examples where lore was broken well, three examples where lore was broken bad, and everything in between. So, let's talk birdie, birdies. Example one, the Disney's Aladdin. It is a good example of a story where the lore is broken completely from top to bottom because in, if you read the original story, it absolutely does not follow the source material at all, starting with the fact that the setting actually took place in China. There were actually there was actually a, a genie of the ring as well as a genie of the lamp, and Aladdin himself was actually a jerk. He was not a hero at all. He was not a good person. He was actually very selfish. Often I even wondered if he even deserved to have the happily ever after he got in the end. But Disney's Aladdin is a complete reimagining. In fact, it's a good case of lore being broken for the better because it's not really a retelling of Aladdin at all. It's a completely new story in a completely new setting with completely new character characters with uh, new motives, new personalities, and everything. They just share names, but it still can be called an adaption, an adaption as well as an inspiration by the original story because it abides by the, as the Sorcerer Supreme would call, constant points. Like the fact that it has to have a, a genie of a lamp with the three wishes, the fact that it was Aladdin of all people who had to be the one to get the lamp, there's a princess, there's a sultan, and eventually the guy who wanted to have the lamp to begin with comes back. Another good example of uh, the story not being a retelling and just being an adaptation or an inspiration is A Maid in Manhattan, Disney's The Princess and the Frog, and my favorite reimagining of Cinderella, Ever After. And fun fact about that one is that Leonardo da Vinci appears in the movie, one of my favorite artists. So, any questions, any two cents on that, Papa Gunner? Well, I would say that Aladdin is great because he has that wonderful character arc. Of He actually does start out pretty selfish. He's really, he's just trying to survive. That's going to happen, right? Like, when you, when you have to just survive, you're going to be selfish. And then have that arc, too, where, like... Oh, he made that promise to to the genie and then he goes back on it and then he goes like you know what it's the right thing to do you know even if my life could be better and everything could be fixed because of him it's just the right thing to do and so that it was his character arc really seems more important than the lore does at that point although i would argue that even then aladdin wasn't selfish stealing bread because you're starving and desperate is not exactly the same as stealing gold because you're greedy right like, you know, like how jafar wanted the lamp he didn't need the lamp he had a pretty good life he just wanted it because he wanted more but yes that's the reason why breaking the lore in those situations is perfectly fine because it does obey the constant points of the original lore but it's also telling a really good story that's cohesive well thought out and all that which brings me to my next point a case of breaking the lore is when you break the character. A very good example of this is the Telltale Batman video game. Joker is actually a friend of Bruce Wayne's, which that within itself you would say is the biggest act of blasphemy because one of the most iconic things about Batman and Joker is their enmity. But in this game, they're friends. In fact, Joker is a very sympathetic character. But the thing is, is that this is not the definitive Batman universe. This is a Batman story, a Batman universe. And this is a Joker, not the Joker. Kind of like how the Joker played by Jack Nicholson in the original 1989 movie 
and the Heath Ledger Joker and the Joaquin Phoenix Jokers, they're all different Jokers. Well, Telltale Joker is a very, very different person. He's still eccentric. He's still got a bit of a crazy, like a crazy, a little bit of a dangerous streak to him, but he's not actually bad. He's a very, in fact, a very lonely, a very sad character who uses comedy and uh, joking around as his gimmick as a way of coping with his inner pain. In fact, he has a lot of parallels with Batman, Bruce Wayne, in that he too puts up a front of being the big tough guy who always seems to know what he's doing and have it together, but in reality is very sad and lonely himself. So in this situation, breaking the feature, breaking their enmity and turning them into friends works because they're the story, the world, and the characters are rewritten in a way where this friendship could work. You're not just saying one, saying Joker wakes up one day and is now Bruce Wayne's friend. And that doesn't work. Right. I, I, I enjoy those games a lot. The best thing is you get to choose and your choices shape the characters. And that's what I felt like was the strength of that is that you're shaping both of those characters based off of your choices. And so that was a really unique take. Yes, but that also reinforces the point. You're... They don't become friends or enemies just because simply because that's a predetermined role. It's because of actions, choices that the characters make. You can choose to be very compassionate and patient with the Joker while not enabling him to be bad. Or you can just be very cruel to him and be and in turn become enemies with him like the, the story usually goes. Mm -hmm. But anyways, on to the next point, which is one that is very... A little iffy with me, I have to admit, but I'm going to try to keep my bias about, uh, out of it. It's when you bend characters. And when I say bend, it means you change their race, their religion, their gender, and things like that. Usually I myself don't like doing this because I find that every time you do, you waste a chance at showcasing an existing character who is already like that. And also I find that in the long run, you actually hurt the very party that you're trying to represent. Like you can only find value in a character who was previously a man, a woman, a, a straight person, a Christian person, or things like that. Like I prefer not to do it, but I'm not hard-headed about it, which is why... I will consider like this an example of breaking lore in terms of bending. Good, which I think we already already know which one it is. Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury in the MCU. That is possibly the golden standard of when you bent a character and it worked. Simply because, well not just simply, actually it's for a lot of reasons. The fact that Nick Fury is a B-list character, in which case his appearance, at least the only part of his appearance that's iconic is the fact that he's got an eye patch, he's a man, a very masculine man, and his presence his presence gives off this authority. It doesn't matter if he's not white, as long as he's at least, at the very least, an adult man, masculine, and American. Like, it's how I also feel about a lot of race bands, which is why in the latest uh, Batman media, Cape Crusader, a lot of the characters are race bent, like Jim Gordon, his daughter, even Harleen Quinzel, they're all race bent, but you know, it's taking place in North America, USA. It's a colorful society. If you're at the very least American, I think we can overlook it. The point is, is that Nick Fury being black in the MCU, it doesn't have any impact on the story whatsoever, nor does it impact the character, in which case you can just as easily return to form in comics with Nick Fury being white with brown hair that's graying on the sides and they did what say you to that uh, right and the thing is it's crazy that you mentioned this because in the ultimate comics they it totally worked and I think the guy that wrote it was like I'm gonna write Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury like that was his plan and so it worked perfectly when they made the MCU to be like oh well we're gonna have this guy be instead of what's his name Hoffman which he did his own version and he looked great I didn't see it so I don't know how good he was he looked apart but the point is is that in that version in the in the 616 comic universe that version works and they tried bringing in the a, like a young black Nick Fury and once again because he's not like this experienced guy people just didn't respect his authority and it just didn't work when they tried to transfer they're like oh we're gonna kill off the old Nick Fury and we're gonna have like this Nick Jr it didn't work because of the way that they went about it how it works how it didn't work and that's why 
specifically mm -hmm. exactly right there. I have to agree. That's why I didn't like it. Because at the very least, if you're going to make a, a, a bend of a character, make sure they still are that character. I mean, going back to Cape Crusader, they did the ultimate change of all. They made Penguin, of all people, a woman. But it still worked. Because she acts like the Penguin. She looks like the Penguin. She does exactly what the Penguin is expected to do in said situations. She's not simply a gender Ben. She mm -hmm. is the Penguin in all the ways that matter. All the good times Ben uh, Breaking War was done right. Now's the tough part where we get into the times Breaking War was done wrong. Maybe this is the most debatable one, but Netflix's take on She-Ra and the Princesses of Power by Noelle Stevenson. There's a lot to unpack with this one, and I'm not, and no, the art style is not one of them because art is the most subjective thing in the world. The number one problem that was very obvious to me from the get-go, even before it was even said in the commentary or documentaries, was that Noelle Stevenson didn't know the original source material. She didn't watch She-Ra, she didn't know anything about it. She doesn't know what Shira's story really is. I would say that not only did it show in the actual TV series itself, it suffered because of it. Like, this was a case of the lore not only being broken, it was shattered. And by no fault of hers, she was picked to do a job that unfortunately she was not a good fit for. Another, the most obvious example was the design of Shira herself. And note, I'm saying Shira, not Adora. Shira is an A-list, possibly S-list character, where her appearance does in fact matter to the story because it's a it's a part of her character. Just as uh, the Superman's uh, black hair, blue eyes, angelic, handsome face, and yet his Titan body is relevant to his character. Shira has to look fantastical because she's a fantastical being. Yet she was watered down to look like a tomboyish yet uh, angelic uh, super kid. And while if this was an original character, there would be nothing wrong with that, it's just not Shira. Also, it's not a very good look in terms of uh, for girls in progressive writing because in every media that He Man was rebooted into, the 2000s, the Masters uh, of the Universe Revelation and Revolution, and just recently the Netflix 3D cartoon. While sometimes a a Prince Adam was indeed reimagined as a kid, He-Man was always was always uh, looked like He-Man. He was always a big muscular man, handsome, had the beautiful blonde hair and the big, big uh, sword and did fantastical things. The one time Shira got rebooted, she was like, you look at this and you're like, this is not Shira. And it, it has nothing to do with her uh, <clears throat> measurements, we'll put it politely. It has to do with the fact that when you look at a character who's like A-list and iconic, you expect them to look like the character. And it's the same with the story. There's no mention of uh, Shira being a twin. The, the, the way the characters, the way the world works on Etheria, it's not Etheria at all. Even the constant points, they're not respected. Like Shira needs the sword, the sword to uh, to become Shira. Yet, spoiler alert, she shatters the original sword. That's that's like all wrong. This is not the way the the lore of Shira works. These are constant points that matter. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Once again, more to your point is this is so far removed. There's so many generations apart from the original that I didn't realize this stuff. I knew of Shira, but I do still agree though, because yeah, she it it I adds kind of like that Captain Marvel essence where it's like you could still be a kid and then once you transform, now you're this larger than life adult character that people yeah, are just blown away by him. right so yeah they, they definitely should have done that and could have done like you said if you don't know the source material you can't really do it and you should do your research so that it is more you're doing justice to both you can make something new and at the same time do justice to the original and that's some that is a problem that we see time and time again that people don't do whether it be in the mcu or in the dceu or wherever right it's it's, it's all across the board it happens every all everywhere star wars every everybody does it where 
they don't do justice or they do because they do get the, the people that there's a good mix of new people and people that know the original stuff. Yes, and I think most importantly of all, you have to love it, like Henry Cavill said. If you don't even like what you're working with, why are you working with it? Which brings me to my next point. The character assassination of Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi and in the sequel trilogy in general. And I know it sounds harsh of me to say character assassination, but that's the best way I can put the reimagination. I mean, I'm sorry, the reimagining of Luke Skywalker as a bitter old man. I did not like it, not only did not like it, I admit it, even from a professional standpoint, that's not Luke Skywalker. The guy who, in my previous video, I said, showed mercy to his father and managed to pull him out of the dark side and back into the light. Now you're trying to convince us that he saw darkness in his own nephew and was willing to even consider killing him when he was still just a kid. Luke Skywalker would never do that. Luke Skywalker, what I would imagine he would do if I was the one, uh, if this was in my hands, and no, this is in my hands, I can't speak for everyone, he would have just let him go uh, and say, look, you don't have what it takes to be a Jedi. I'm sorry, you're meant for great things, but not on this path. That would set uh, Kylo Ren off into uh, eventually pursuing the dark side and then coming back to kill off all his students. And I could imagine Luke falling into a depression because of that, but not stay in that place for very long. I find that, uh, I know why they did it, it's because it was an attempt to uplift uh, Ray's character, but that's not a very good way of lifting up a character. First of all, her character should be able to stand on her own two feet, Ray. She should not, you can't uplift a character by having her stomp on the neck of an existing character or rewriting or reinventing a character who's beloved and who's heroic to be a total loser. That's just wrong, it's disrespectful to the lore, it's disrespectful to the character, and also it, it doesn't make any sense. It's like if you were to suddenly reimagine the definitive Superman to be an abusive to Lois Lane while being married to her. He would never become this way. This is not Superman. Right, and the main part about when you're writing is how did we get here? Like, make it make sense. And I don't think they did a good job or good enough job of making that make sense because it's just like you said, him being depressed, him, you know, making this mistake and them showing both sides, yeah, it worked, but it still didn't make sense like how they got there and why he stayed away for so long. There should have been some more to it because it just doesn't make sense. It's like, this is your sister's and your best friend's son and you're you're not gonna talk to them. You're not gonna say anything to them first. You're not gonna, like, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. And so if you don't hit those marks, if it doesn't make sense, that's the biggest problem. Make it make yeah, sense. And also the fact that they just had him die after being seen again after so long in the war. Like, come on, I, w I wouldn't have done that either. Like, it would have made more sense for Luke to, I don't know, considering that he is the main hero of Star, war Star Wars, to ascend to Master Yoda's position as, uh, as starting a new Jedi Order. I mean, even that, that is a thing that is from like the extended universe. That's an ability that he does in the extended universe. They didn't explain any of that. And they didn't say if at some point he would have said, hey, I got this ace up my sleeve, but it's going to sap me of my life energy and it's going to kill me. You know, if they would have said a, a line as simple as that, you'd have been like, okay, that makes sense why he died. They never explained any of these things. And once again, in writing, you have to make it make sense or it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. At this point, you're you're committing wish fulfillment, which is the most unprofessional move in writing in my own experience and in my own observation. Sometimes as a writer, you have to do things you don't like. And sometimes if something just makes you too uncomfortable to do, like writing in a character you don't vibe with, why are you even using them? But that just and finally, that leads into my final discussion, which is uh, going back to race, uh, gender, and all that bending done wrong. But before I get into that, for context, it's about Lord of the Rings, specifically what Wizards of the Coast did with the Lord of the Rings trading card game. But anyways, for context, Lord of the Rings is supposed to mirror a lot of Europe, specifically 
the Middle Earth, the main part that we see involved in the War of the Ring is supposed to mirror Europe, specifically the Celtic parts, uh, so to say. And it's, a, it's actually a definitive fact that the parts that mirror Africa, India, Asia uh, are not on good terms politically and are not on speaking terms with those parts of the world. Hence why we don't see BIPOC people in the Lord of the Rings story. Everyone is white. That's just the reality of the situation. If this was a reimagining of Lord of the Rings where it was in the future and like modern day Europe, it's there is interracial marriage and it's a very colorful society now. You're going to see the, the, the descendants uh, be of color, most likely, kind of like what another cartoon uh, from back in the day, Cla Class of the Titans, where the main protagonists are descendants of famous uh, Greek heroes in literature. They're not the same gender, they're not the same race, or even ha entirely have the same personalities, uh, more or less, as the original Greek heroes. And that's okay. They're descendants. That's to be expected, not the carbon copies. The other, the other situation of which I could I could imagine race bending working is that if if it was in modern day times or in another, or if it was an adaptation taking place in another part of the world, kind of like. Going back to the princess and the frog, it was taking place in New Orleans. Obviously, the princess, the prince, uh, and everything, it's going to be different. But Wizards of the Coast expected us to just sit there and accept that their version of the characters were multiracial or BIPOC, if you prefer. There, It didn't work. And it, I'm not saying that the designs were bad. They were beautiful. For instance, Black Aragorn, in my opinion, their interpretation of him... He was absolutely cool to look at, but he's not Aragorn. Again, Aragorn is an A-list character where his appearance is relative to his character because he's royalty. He's supposed to be purebred of uh, his royal bloodline. He can't be mixed. He's, it doesn't make any sense. It has nothing to do with uh, where you stand on uh, this, this subject. If you are taking taking a story and having it take place in a medieval setting, being of pure blood matters. And like I said, Aragorn is iconic. His brown hair, his rugged features, and even just the fact that he's white, that's what he is. It's not racist or bigoted to respect that. Just like it's not, I don't know, Hydus to say that Dwayne Johnson is not a good casting choice to play Frodo Baggins, who is a hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's my point. Like, you, you, he's not... The, 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 or just like you wouldn't have a man play Elwin. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry for my laughing, but that's the point. It's not that... I, I'm not a bigot or anything. I, I hope you know that. Like, it, it's just like you look at this and it, it doesn't make any sense. It looks laughable. Like, we're looking at the cards and we're laughing. It's like... It, <laughs> Right. No, I, I, I absolutely agree that that seems weird. I like what they've done in Rings of Power. I haven't read, read the Cimmerillion, so I don't know if there's characters that they've changed. So I can only assume and I've heard that they are doing their own thing. So they've done that with characters that they're like, oh, hey, there's this black elf. And I'm like, works for me. But once again, when you do that, I feel like you have to include everyone. And I haven't seen any Latinx characters. I've seen some Mexicans that look like dwarves. I've also seen some Hispanic people people that look like they could be elves so it's like when you include one that you need you should start and include everybody because that's the problem it's like you go okay well we're gonna but then we're not gonna include these people and you're like why though because that doesn't make sense i do like what they've done with the show and i do appreciate the show and hopefully we'll see a little more inclusion with new characters like you said if they're new characters it can work and it can work well but when you're just changing blatantly for no reason it just it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work the other thing i also have to comment on that and uh it's a bit of a counter argument. I don't like the system of treating specific groups like uh, being uh, black, Asian, Hispanic, uh, all that, or being a woman, being trans, being gay, being bi and all that, like Pokemon where you got to catch them all or trading cards where you have to have one of each to complete a set. <laughs> I do not like it at all. Being of us, I'm not a woman because I, I want to be cool. It's just what I am. It's right. uh, you should respect identities as being natural. 
And that just like you can't control who you're going to meet in your life and who you're going to be friends with and which one of your friends are going to be uh, BIPOC or gay or LGBT in general and all that, you shouldn't try to control the cast in that unnatural matter of which you're reducing each type of person to a checklist on a list. Like, I don't like it at all. It's not respectful. And also it becomes pandering, which I absolutely hate in a lot of modern writing. It's unprofessional and it in fact perpetuates a lot of stereotypes and a lot of, uh, I don't know, social uh, standing, which I also don't like. It's, uh, I don't like it at all. And also it's not good to do this. Inclusion should feel natural and you have to also accept that sometimes you're not going to have a type of character. You're not going to have like, let's just say, a Jewish character or a Muslim character or even a gay character or at all and that's okay you write what comes naturally to you kind of like it in my upcoming character in psycho Borg, that's going to make an appearance in the next chapter castor who is my first ever really fleshed out non-binary character if you don't count ginger the robot who looks like a gingerbread man in cupcake war machine i didn't make a castor non-binary to to take off a checkbox i made them that way because when creating them I wasn't sure if I should make Castor a man or a woman and realized that as I was fleshing out their character, they had the attributes of both, yet gender was not very relevant to their role in the story or how they would develop. So I decided, you know what, I'll just, they were just meant to be this way. That's what I mean. Like, don't pander, just make the character natural. And that's why I don't like, like, the Wizards of the Coast example or a lot of other examples, or even uh, politely disagree with you about rings of power, what they did there. Like, it, it has to make sense. It has to feel natural. And it, does this character actually add to the story, or are they there just to be the character who's Black, LGBT, a woman, and all that? I, I hate tokenization so much. I find it backwards, right? It goes back to Nick Fury being played by Samuel Jackson. He wasn't Black actor. Thing. Like you don't act black, you don't act like a woman, you don't act like this, you just are. That's all I have to say about the subjects, about breaking lore, about when it works, when it doesn't, and my advice, at least my advice, and it's very subjective also because art always is subjective. But, uh... Right, that was that was great. Uh, thank you very much. And and I agree because I've written myself, and there's a character. I have a trans character, because and then it's it's based off of my off of a relative that I had and that's why I wrote that character in there and I was like it works it makes sense for the story and that's not like oh this is that's all they're about you know they have all these you know they add to the group and stuff so it makes sense it works at least I think so uh hopefully someday people will find out you know and I'll, and I'll find out if it works or not uh and it's great it's great having this discussion with you we can have this stuff and have these uh conversations to talk about these things that are are sometimes like we or iffy or, or uncomfortable because I feel like they need to be talked about. So thank you very much for, for joining me. And once again, check out MK Wizard on all of the platforms, Facebook, Instagram, X or Twitter or anything, oh, especially uh, threads. So yeah, that's it for us. Talk nerdy to me. And talk birdie to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>